When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Morning, church. Glad you guys are here. Uh, and we are going to continue on in our Like Jesus series with week two. But before we do that, I just want to make quick mention of week one. Uh, last week when we kicked this off, we talked about giving like Jesus, which meant that, that we talked about money. And as uncomfortable as that conversation can be, our, our goal w- was to be as direct and, and clear as possible when it came to the teachings of Christ in regard to the topic of money. And many of you responded in, in a very, very positive way. I'm happy to, to report that last week we, we we made budget as a church, meaning the amount that came in was generously given by our church, uh, met the need that, that we set out each week as, as a weekly goal that allows us to, to achieve the work of our church. And so that happened last week, but that wasn't necessarily surprising. You see, typically when we talk about money from the pulpit, we, we make budget that particular week. Purely coincidental, I am sure. Um, but uh, I think it is a, a good opportunity for us. I, I often say I believe we're supposed to function as a as a family and and families thrive on transparency. And so it's an opportunity for us to be transparent about a reality that that our church does face, but an opportunity I believe that each of us have. The reality is this, over the course of the last 19 weeks, we have only made budget four times. So so in the span of 19 weeks, we, we made budget uh, four times. A few other times we, we came close, but we just didn't quite cross the threshold. Now, I don't say that to create an, an atmosphere of guilt by any means, and I also don't say that to, to sound any alarm bells. We, we have a very committed, very diligent finance team that pays very, very close attention. We also have a very committed, very creative staff that makes adjustments when adjustments are necessary. The bottom line is we, we carry a mentality that we're going to do our best, that when less comes in, we're going to make sure that less goes out. But when that does happen, it, it does impede our, our ability to adequately do what God has trusted us to do. We, we do have to get creative. We, we have to work around things. And I bring all that up because last week we said this, that, that when we talk about giving, I ask you to boldly and generously give. And I do that without an ounce, an ounce of trepidation because our kingdom work and the health of our collective hearts depend on it. What we've been entrusted with, it's it's vitally important. We've been entrusted with extending the kingdom of God in our immediate community. In order to do that to the best of our ability, it does at times require resources. Resources certainly aren't the only thing it requires, not even the most important thing it requires, but they do in many ways make it possible to make a greater and greater impact in northern Kentucky. What's far more important is that the the regular conversation about money and God's desire for it helps us protect our own hearts. It helps us make sure that our hearts are as healthy as they can possibly be. And and I want to draw all of our attention to that because I believe every single week you have an opportunity to cultivate these two things. And it comes in the form uh, of our weekly focus email. Maybe you're not familiar with the focus email. Hopefully when I'm done uh, talking about this this morning, you you will make uh, quick work of of joining that list. But the focus email is an email that goes out every Thursday morning. It hits your inbox ridiculously early in the morning so that hopefully you have it as soon as you wake up. And it gives you a great snapshot of what's going on in our church right now. But at the bottom of that, it it shows two numbers, two metrics that we track, one of which is uh, offering. We, We track that as a metric, not because it's the only metric or the most important metric, but it does tell us something about our church, just like the other metric we we track, which is attendance. Knowing how many people are gathering with us helps us understand. It gives us a snapshot of of the health of our church, and and, and tracking offering does the exact same thing. It lets us know whether or not we're accomplishing these things. Are are we making a maximum impact in our community, and are our collective hearts becoming healthier and healthier? Those two numbers help us indicate whether or not that is a reality, and I think you 
you being aware of those numbers also gives you two really, really important opportunities. And the first one is this. Our published numbers should guide your prayers on behalf of our church. When you get that email each week, I hope you look at those numbers, and I hope you will immediately take that as an opportunity to pray very, very intentionally for our church. I would ask you to do that every single week. Pray for our church because we need it. Pray for the health of our church. Pray that our church would grow. Pray that our church's impact on the community around us would grow. Pray for the leaders that are making decisions on a daily basis that guide this body forward. I would ask you, use this as an opportunity to pray for for our church. Second opportunity is that our published numbers are a great way to check your own heart. As you look at those numbers, simply ask yourself, am I doing everything I can to impact those numbers? Am I allowing God to do the refining work in my heart every single week that makes me fully engaged in the life of his church? Am I doing everything I can to make sure that we're having the biggest impact we can have? Am I doing everything I can to make sure that I'm inviting people into this family on a regular basis? And so just wanted to mention those two things. Again, if you're not currently getting the focus email, I would challenge you to sign up for that list today. You can do that by visiting your info center as soon as we're done here today, and they will get you squared away. But as for this week, we are in week two of Like Jesus, and we are talking about serving like Jesus. Now, a lot of times when, when we talk about serving in the context of the kingdom, we, we, we leverage it in very, very specific ways. We talk about serving inside and outside the walls of our church. We're going to talk about it very, very broadly today. We're going to talk about it more so in the context of, of it becoming a mentality that we carry, that of a servant. And to do that, we're, we're going to be almost exclusively in that passage we've already read from. We're going to be in John chapter 13. We're going to look at the first 17 verses. So I I would remind you, if you have a Bible, if you have a device, it's going to be great to follow along today because our our desire is to go as deep into this passage as we possibly can. In fact, I'm only going to use one other scripture and it's right at the top and, and it's just to give us some context, kind of set the stage for this conversation. It's Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45. Christ says this to his disciples, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, this, this servant mentality that we're talking about today is, is something that Christ consistently taught, consistently invested in the life of his followers, but it's also something that he consistently modeled. And, and that's what is so clearly conveyed in John chapter 13, Christ's overwhelming willingness to take on the role of a servant in order to lead his people forward. And th- this is probably the most famous passage when it comes to, you know, the, the Christ-like servant that we are called to. This is typically where people go, but there's way more going on in this passage than than we often realize at first glance. John sets the stage in verse 1. It says this, It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, The fact that what's happening in John 13 is happening in proximity to the Passover festival, that's actually hugely important, but we're going to get to that in a moment. Where I want to start is that Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. It's often asked, like, what was the exact moment where Christ knew exactly who he was? Like, he knew where he had come from, that he had come from the Father, and that he was going back to the Father. When was the moment that he knew he was destined for a throne on which he would reign for all of eternity? The fact of the matter is we, we don't have a crystal clear answer of exactly when Christ knew that. Very, would, could, very well could be that he, he discovered it, you know, as his relationship with God, you know, progressed. It could be that his first conscious thought as a little tiny baby was was complete awareness of who he was, of where he'd come from, and where he was going. We simply don't know, but we do pick up signs along the way. For example, at age 12, you may remember this story, Christ got left behind after his family had taken a trip to Jerusalem. They're on their road on the road back home, and they look around, they don't see Jesus, and they panic, and Mary and Joseph, they run back to Jerusalem, and where do they find him? They find him in the temple court talking to the scholars about God's word, and they 
ask him, what are you doing? Like, why did you stay behind? And he said, I had to be in my father's how? So, so at age 12, he understands who God is and he understands who he is. And another question that often comes up is, did Christ know? It? And at what point did he know that, that the road to that throne on which he would reign for all of eternity had to pass through a cross? What was the point that Christ realized that, that he was destined for a throne, but before he was destined for a throne, he was destined to die a criminal's Death Again, we, we don't know the exact moment that that became clear to Christ, but he gives hints along the way that he knows where this road is going. And by John 13, he has crystal clarity that that's where it's going because it's about to happen. In fact, not long after this meal will be the exact moment that Christ is betrayed. Not long after this meal, he will encounter pain that surpasses any pain that any of us have ever felt. He will, he will encounter the full wrath of God. It will all be on him. Christ knows that that's coming. And that's what makes this moment so compelling is that Christ knows that the hour has come. And we must not miss this because it sets an important tone for the rest of this passage. The servanthood that we will be called to by the completion of verse 17 is very much built on the mentality being projected projected in verse 1. Christ served because Christ loved And this loving service was the necessary path to that throne that would never perish or fade. There is quite simply not enough words for us to convey the radical love on display in this passage. And that becomes even more clear as we drift in to verse 2, to verses 2 through 5. Lots happening here. The, the evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to uh, betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, our attention typically goes to the second half of this passage. Jesus interrupting the meal, getting up, putting on this towel, grabbing the basin of water and washing his disciples' feet. But there's a lot that happens at the beginning of this passage that kind of sets the theme for what's about to take place. Notice the evening meal was in progress. I said it was significant that this was happening in proximity to the Passover festival. Well, this is actually the Passover meal which kicks off the Passover festival. And the Passover festival was a really big deal. It, it was one of three Three major festivals in Jewish culture. It was the first of the three. It led into the other three. And it was a commemoration. It was in remembrance of what God had begun to do in Egypt. Most notably for the Passover festival was the celebration of the lamb that was slain and the blood that was smeared on the doorpost of all of God's people. And the reason that this happened was that very night in Egypt, the angel of death was coming to execute judgment on the Egyptian households. And the smeared blood of the lamb would indicate to the angel of death that he should, in fact, pass over that home. The Passover festival was a yearly celebration of God's deliverance. And that is very much the theme of what Christ is walking into, the ultimate deliverance. We celebrate yearly the deliverance of the lamb, but this is complete deliverance. A new lamb is about to be slain once and for all. Blood will never have to be shed again because Jesus Christ will be enough. Deliverance is the early theme of this moment. Deliverance is the early theme of this meal. But then, then John notes that the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. So in the midst of this theme of deliverance, you also have the distinct presence of betrayal. And there's an additional theme of resistance. We live in the midst of a collision between deliverance and resistance. Resistance with the aim to distract, to disrupt, and to discourage. We often refer to this as the already, not yet. We know what Christ has already accomplished. The disciples will become very, very clear on what Christ is about to accomplish. We know that the cross has happened. But until Christ's second coming, it's not fully complete. We we still wait for the day that he regathers us once and for all. And so we live in between these two realities. 
victory has already been achieved, yet there is this perceived resistance from our enemy. Now, ultimately, we know the victory is certain, the perceived resistance, it's all smoke and mirrors, but that doesn't make it any less intimidating, and it doesn't make it any less tension-filled. I, I was captivated in, in 2004 by, by something that many people in our country and many people across the world were also captivated by. I'm sure there's a lot of things that happened in 2004, but the thing I'm referring to was the fact that the Boston Red Sox won the World Series. Okay, I'm not a huge Boston Red Sox fan, but I was completely sucked in to the World Series in 2004. And the reason was, it was the first time in a very long time that the Boston Red Sox has achieved winning the World Series. And if you know anything about baseball, you know that it got even more interesting because there was this perception leading up to that that the reason the Boston Red Sox hadn't won the World Series and the amount of time that they hadn't won one was because they were, in fact, under a curse. The curse of the Bambino. Turns out that way back when the Boston Red Sox had this very notable up-and-coming player. His name was Babe Ruth. You probably remember Babe Ruth, but you probably remember him as somebody who played for the Yankees. It's because the Red Sox traded him to the Yankees. In exchange, they got money that the owner of the Red Sox used to like fund a play or something. It was ridiculous. Babe Ruth goes on to be arguably the greatest baseball player of all time. The Yankees go on to have unprecedented success, most notably at the expense of the Red Sox. Red Sox would go on an elongated World Series drought, and they wouldn't just not win the World Series, they would lose their opportunity to win the World Series in the most devastating ways possible, again and again and again. And it caused all kinds of people within the sports world to go, yeah, they're definitely cursed. It's got to be a curse. But in 2004, they broke the proverbial curse. They won the World Series, but it was how they won that was so captivating. They found themselves in the American League Championship Series. This is the series you have to win to go on to the World Series. And who should they be playing? But the Yankees themselves. The Yankees, the most favored team in baseball that year to win the World Series, they go up three games to nothing. Now, this is a best of seven series. It means the first team to win four games moves on. The Yankees are up three to nothing. And in the history of baseball, no team had ever overcome that deficit. But the Boston Red Sox did. They just kept winning. They won four straight games to go on to the World Series. And in the World Series, they faced the dreaded St. Louis Cardinals. We can appreciate that, right? And this is what happened, okay? This is game four. Red Sox are a team of destiny at this point. Like, who's going to win? They win the first three games. This is Keith Folk. He was their closer all throughout the postseason. He's pitching to Edgar Renteria, one of the most clutch hitters in baseball that year. Here's the final pitch of the game. There's two outs. Everybody's been growing in anticipation. Hits it right back to the pitcher. He tosses it. Doug Mankiewicz came in just to play defense. Celebration erupts. Like, everybody is going crazy. This is happening on the Cardinals field, which makes it even more awesome because they're devastated. We love that. But this is what I think is the most interesting moment of all. This moment right here. Okay, I have clear, vivid memories of sitting in my dusty apartment as a college student watching this happen. And I distinctly remember this moment and thinking to myself, this moment is actually really, really significant for Red Sox fans. Because this was the moment of the final out where the ball was in the air. This is as routine of a play as it gets. Like you practice this play, dribbler back to the pitcher, toss to the first baseman. You practice this from T-ball. Like this is something you know how to do. This is as routine as it gets. But for the Red Sox, they had watched very routine things turn out in very disastrous ways for a very long time. And so every Red Sox fan is holding their breath as this happens. They know where the ball is going. They are confident that Doug Mankiewicz is going to catch it, that they are going to win the World Series. But right here, the ball is still in the air. It's the already, just not yet. And especially in hindsight, we know without a shadow of a doubt, nothing can go wrong here. Like we've already seen the celebration. We know it happens. The out is going to be made. The Boston Red Sox are going to win the World Series. And this is a perfect representation of our situation. Okay, it's, it's even more certain than the Boston Red Sox. Like, we know without a shadow of doubt where that ball is going. We know that it's going to be caught. We know the end of the story. It's already certain. It just hasn't yet happened. And that's the tension that we live in. 
That's the collision of deliverance and resistance that we find ourselves in on a regular basis. Yet in the midst of that, we can have assurance. Why? Because of Jesus. Here's what he goes on to say. Back in our passage, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. The enemy is going to do a whole bunch of stuff. He's going to prompt guys like Judas towards betrayal. There's going to be limitless resistance, but all that resistance is fabricated. All things are already under his power. Christ is already in control. The throne is already established. The devil can do whatever he wants to disrupt, distract, and discourage, but he can't stop it because Christ is supreme. And that's what makes what happens next so outrageous. Christ pauses the meal, this meal that that commemorates the celebration of deliverance. He pauses the celebration. He gets up from the table. He takes off his outer garment because he doesn't want to get it messy. He puts on a towel. He grabs a basin of water, and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. This is absolutely insane. You've likely heard why before, because back then, feet were absolutely disgusting. Why? Very, very simple reasons. Dirt roads, primary mode of transportation was livestock, made the roads even dirtier. Primary mode of footwear was a sandal. Feet were disgusting. And so it was customary. When you came into somebody's home, when you came to a meal, you would have your feet washed. Typically, if you were a host, you would make arrangements that somebody washed your guest's feet for them. Most notably, a servant's, because it was such a demeaning job. What's interesting here, Two very, very significant things. Number one, Christ doesn't do this before the meal. He interrupts the meal. And he doesn't arrange for a servant to do this. He takes on the role of the servant. Those two things should indicate to us that something very, very significant is happening here. In the middle of the already, not yet, Christ wants to draw our attention to the demeanor of a servant. This is very, very important, but, but initially for his disciples... This is very, very uncomfortable. Notice verses 6 and 7. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, you are going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Now, something worth noting here is that Peter, at this point in Christ's ministry, as we said, we're very, very close to the cross here. We're very, very close to that victory emerging, which means we're also very, very close to the emergence of the early church. At this point in his ministry, Peter has begun to kind of be set apart as somewhat of a leader of the disciples. Peter doesn't fully understand that yet. The disciples don't fully understand that yet. But Christ, very, very aware of it and intentionally slanting the floor in that direction. You may remember, Peter was the first disciple to speak up and make this bold confession about Christ. It's it's the words we continue to mimic in in the process of baptism. Uh, Christ asked his disciples, who do you think I am? Peter very, very confidently, very, very boldly spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, our Lord. He understood who Christ was. And Christ looked at him and says, because you understand who I am, I'm going to tell you who you are. And went on to say, you're a rock. You're a foundation on which I'm going to build my church. What Christ is talking about is leadership. He's going to give Peter more and more leadership. And we see this play out very, very soon. Day of Pentecost. So Christ has now ascended back to heaven. He has commissioned his disciples to carry on the work of the church that he has now established. And what happens? Holy Spirit fills them. And then what happens? Peter goes outside and begins to preach the church's very, very sermon. In the early days of the church, Peter was very much looked to for that leadership. And so all of this is happening inside of Peter. And they get to this moment where where his master, his Lord, the one he has confessed allegiance to, stands up and starts taking on the role of a servant. And and ultimately what Peter's saying is this is completely backwards. This isn't how it should work. So he says this, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Now his his defiance, it's well-intentioned, it's just not well-placed. He simply can't fathom how this should be the order of events. A master should not serve his students. The students should serve the master. But notice how Christ responds to him. He says this, Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Peter, if we're going to continue to go the direction that we've been going, 
if you're going to continue to do what I've been preparing and commissioning you to do, if the rubber is going to hit the proverbial road here soon, this needs to happen. What is happening must happen. Christ is revealing that this moment is bigger than dirty feet in a basin of water. This whole thing has to do with the deliverance. And Christ is painting a picture of the demeanor and the necessary attitude that we'll have to carry in the face of resistance. And the already not yet, this is who you are called to be. And then Peter, being the eager little guy he is, he, he responds like this. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Dump the whole thing on me, Jesus. I want to be clean. And Peter is often easy to make fun of, but, but, but there is something so admirable and so beautiful about his very simple and childlike faith here. He takes Christ at his word and his sincere heart is to be obedient. So if you need to wash my feet for me to be with you, Jesus, then wash every single part of me. Now, this response is not just cute, okay? It's it's actually a launching pad by which Christ will establish something that is hugely important but often gets overlooked. Notice what he says next. Then Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet, their whole body, is clean. He tells Peter and the others that their bath has already taken place, but that going forward to remain his, they will need to allow him to wash their feet. This sounds super confusing. It's actually pretty simple. What Christ is ultimately talking about is the balance between justification and sanctification. Those are big, fancy church words, but the very, very simple understanding attached to both. Justification makes you right with God. Christ accomplishes this on the cross. Once you accept it and respond in obedience, which we believe is signified by being baptized into Christ, then you are clean, as Christ says here. The proverbial bath has happened. Sanctification is the ongoing journey of looking more and more like Christ. Christ. Justification happens once. Sanctification happens every single day. Every single day we must look more and more like Christ. Every single day you must lean into the picture of a king who washes feet. That is why Christ is doing what he's doing. However, in the midst of all of that, and the further exposure of this picture of deliverance, that resistance is still boiling over. Notice this in the second part of verse 10, verse 11. You are clean. He's speaking to his disciples, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. It's very, very important that we capture this before we move on. That everything that Christ is doing, he is doing with full knowledge that one of the men sitting in this room had already made the decision in their heart to betray him. Christ does all of this knowing that Judas had already been prompted by the devil to betray him. John has now indicated multiple times, twice he has pointed out that Judas is present and that Christ knows exactly what's happening in Judas's heart. We must not forget that Christ is aware of this, especially as we read what Christ continues to unpack. He says this in verses 12 to 14. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? Speaking to all of them. He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord. And rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Feet. To understand what Christ is doing here, we have to remember where this relationship between he and his disciples started. Christ approached each of these men and invited them to follow him. It's very, very important that we note that. These men did not take a step towards Christ, and then Christ said, hey, since you took a step towards me, why don't you follow me? No, Christ made the first step. In fact, each of these guys responded to that initial step by Christ with hesitancy, skepticism, even a little bit of fear and doubt, yet... They drew closer. Why? Because they were compelled by the stuff coming out of his mouth, by his teaching. Each of these men noted that that they, they heard things that they had never heard before, and they heard it presented in a way that conveyed authority that they had never seen before either. 
Jesus knew what he was talking about. He was confident in what he was talking about. And he was confident that he was the focal point of all the truth he was supposedly relaying from God. And they were drawn to that. But the longer they listened to this teaching, the more easily, easily they were able to make a very, very important connection. This guy is not just a good teacher. This guy, as Peter confessed, is Lord. And the moment they did that, it changed absolutely everything. And, and Christ actually points to that shift here. Notice he says, you, you knew me as teacher. Let's go back to the last one. You knew me as teacher and Lord, but now you know me as Lord and teacher. You know that the fact that I am your Lord is far more important than the stuff coming out of my mouth. But everything that comes out of my mouth affirms the fact that I am your Lord. And what Christ is doing here in this moment before these disciples is he's establishing an understanding that if I am the Lord of your life, you must put my teaching into action. Do for each other what you just saw me do for you. And then he says this in verse 15. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. He says all of that, and Judas is sitting there. Okay, we can't, we can't miss that. Judas is there, and Christ knows what he is going to do. Christ knows that there is one person in this room that has allowed his heart to become completely poisoned by greed and self-interest, but he serves him anyway. He doesn't dismiss Judas from the room and say, hey, I got to do something with these other guys. Like, can you step out for a minute? And then he says all this stuff and he washes their feet and he affirms, I'm your Lord, I'm your teacher. I want you to do the exact same thing that I did for each other. No, Judas is in there for the entire thing. He served them all. He served Peter, who was so diligently committed to him that he couldn't fathom the idea that Jesus touched his dirty feet. He served him anyway. And he served Judas. And then he said, I want you to do the exact same thing you just saw me do. And maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking to yourself, I can't do that. I can't serve people who are against me. I can't serve people who attack my values. I can't serve people who disagree with me. I can't serve people who would resist me. I would challenge you to look at the example of Christ. Who stood up, who interrupted the celebration to pause. To take off his outer garment, to put on a towel, to grab a basin of water, to put on the uniform of a servant, and then to wash his disciples' dirty feet, including the despicable, disgusting feet of the very man who would betray him. Christ stood in the midst of those men and he washed their feet. He washed the one that was so committed to him that it made him completely uncomfortable that the master should subject himself to these servants by serving in this way. He served him anyway. And then he served the guy who sat quietly in the corner, knowing in his heart, the minute I have an opportunity, I'm going to stab you in the back, man. He served him anyway. And why did he do this? John told us in the very beginning, way back in verse 1, Jesus knew that the hour had come. It was time. It was time to move into the already not yet. It was time for the cross. It was time for the thing that Christ's entire life has been on the trajectory for. It was time for love to become tangible, for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. When Christ loves he loves all the way it is finished that is what christ said from the cross that was a cry of victory in the midst of misery the misery would fade but the victory never will christ knew that the hour had come victory was sealed judas could do whatever the devil had prompted him to do it wouldn't stop it in fact it would only enhance it there was no time for anger or frustration or hate when the hour came. There was only room for love because love had won. Hate will not make it to the end. Greed won't make it. Self-interest won't make it. Love does because love endures, because love lasts, because love is forever. And in the face of resistance, we must cling to the all-surpassing love of Christ and we must serve them, all of them. In the already not yet, your demeanor is to be that of his. 
We serve those who are for us. We serve those who are against us. We serve those who agree with us. We serve those who disagree with us. Like Christ, we have made ourselves servants to all because we know that victory is inevitable. We know the ball will land safely in the first baseman's glove. The celebration cannot be stopped. And our mission is to spread the goodness and the scandalous grace of Jesus Christ by looking just like him. And it is so easy to get distracted by how hard it can be in the midst of this tension between deliverance and resistance. Again, do not allow the presence of Christ's greatest resistance to become lost on us in this most beautiful moment. In the face of betrayal, Christ still said this to his disciples. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You will be blessed if you do them. We don't talk about this word, blessed, nearly enough. I mean, it gets thrown around rather flippantly in popular culture. This is actually a really big deal. What Christ is saying is you make me the Lord of your life. You follow my example. What God is going to reciprocate is blessing, his blessing. He is going to declare it over you. Fun fact, when God declares something, it happens every single time. Do you know what it means for God to declare his blessing over you? It means he declares his goodness and his favor over you. Those are two things that are transcendent. They are limitless. They are unending. This means that this world can call down all the misery it wants on your life, but the goodness and favor and love and patience and peace of God will always be louder because the victory is already sealed because Christ is already in power because he has already taken claim of your life. He is the Lord of your life. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you're empowered to follow the beautiful example that he set for us. And this is a journey that's worth taking. And it's a calling worth rising up to. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you so much for this truth. And Father God, I thank you that it is in fact just that. It is truth. And Father, we, we can build a life on this truth. It's foundational. It it, it can change absolutely everything, Lord, when we're willing to believe it. Lord, when we're willing to put it to the test. Lord, when we're willing to cling to it more than we allow ourselves to be distracted by our enemies' lies. Lord, lies that, that would convince us that this resistance is just simply too great. Though we know the the trajectory of the ball in the air, Lord, the the enemy is so good at sowing doubts that maybe something will go wrong. Maybe something won't pan out. Maybe this celebration isn't as certain as we've come to believe it is. But Father God, they, they are simply just that. They are lies. And So Lord, may we have the boldness in the name and the power of Jesus Christ to break free from those lies. Lord, he has already severed the chains. We simply have to make the decision that we'll no longer drag them. And Father God, when we're not dragging chains, may we run unimpeded into your presence, into your grace, into your love. May it transform everything about us. Lord, that we will now walk boldly and confidently in the character and the demeanor of Christ. And Lord, may it not be lost on us that the chosen character and demeanor of Jesus Christ, our Lord, on the cusp of the greatest victory to ever be known, Lord, was that of a towel-wearing, water-basin-holding servant. So, Father God, may that be us. May we become the servants of all, Lord, that love might be unleashed. The same love that so graciously rescues us, may it rescue others through us. Lord, that our lives might tell the same story of redemption that Christ lived out in front of us. May our lives bring you glory, Father. May they extend hope. May they be filled with joy. We love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.